Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Now, last year when we had some Zoom quizzes, we played a fun round in one of those called Star Wars, Star Trek or the Bible. And what I did is I gave you a name and you had to tell me if they were a character from the movie Star Wars or Star Trek or whether they were a person from the Bible. Well, I've pulled out a few to test you this morning. What I'm going to do is give you three names and you have to decide which one of those names is from is a character from Star Wars, which one is a character from Star Trek and which one is a person from the Bible. So I'll give you all three and then give you a few seconds to work out which is which. So if you're ready, here are your first three. Dodo, Yuhara and Bibble. Dodo, Yuhara and Bibble. Which is from Star Trek, which is from Star Wars and which is from the Bible. Dodo, Yuhara and Bibble. Have a think. Are you there? Okay, here's the answers. Dodo is from the Bible. Yuhara is from Star Trek. And Bibble is a character from Star Wars. Okay, if you got them right, well done. Uh, don't worry if you got them wrong. We'll say that was a practice. Here's the real one. Uh, here's your next three names. The names are Janna, Mash and Zulu. Janna. Mash Zulu. Star Wars, Star Trek, the Bible. Which is which? Jana, Mash and Zulu. Have a think. Don't argue about it. It's just a game. Have you got it? Okay, stop there. Jana, Mash and Zulu. Jana is from Star Wars. Mash was the person from the Bible. And Zulu was... Uh, the character from Star Trek. Well done if you got any or all of those right. Well, when making quizzes like this, the first thing I do is go to these big lists of names you will find throughout the Bible. And in today's reading in Genesis chapter 5, we saw the first major one of these lists. And it is tempting when you are reading the Bible or even when you're preaching a preaching series, to skip over these lists. But these lists are important. And before we get to look at this list particularly and why that matters, I want to tell you and give you three reasons why I think genealogies are important, why these lists are important. You ready? The first one is, they show us the Bible is real life. Well, time jumps are becoming quite a popular device in TV programmes and in films at the moment. It's usually because the actor playing the character can no longer play a 20 year old when they reach 45 or the writers have run out of ideas for a programme set in a university so they jump forward 15 years to write a drama about family life. And as viewers we don't really mind really, we don't care what has happened we just go along with the flow we accepted and carry on watching what happened 15 years later. But say you haven't seen a friend since university. And say you haven't seen a person for 15 years. Well, when you meet, you want to catch up on everything that has happened since the last time you were together. Where did that wife come from? What happened to the dream music career? How have you ended up as an accountant? All these things you'd want to know. And it's the same with the Bible. Genealogy shows us that the Bible is real life. It's history. And yes, when you learn history in school, you study major events, but you know that there was bits in between because that's real life. Event-wise, in the Bible, we jump from Cain and Abel to the flood. But we're reminded that there are years and years between the two events because the Bible is real life. It's history. Secondly, genealogy show us that the Bible is about real people. Not only is it real life, but it's real people. It's easy to think of Adam just in the accounts we read of creation, the fall and with Cain and Abel. But we're reminded in these lists that he lived 930 years. These people were real. They had real daily lives. They had 
Good times and bad times, sad times, busy times, mundane times, sickness and health, just like us. What we're reading in the Bible is accounts of real people. So they show us real life history, they show us real people. But genealogies are also important because they show us that the Bible looks forward. We've talked before about how working out your family tree became popular, really popular, a good few years ago. People wanted to see where they had come from. Shows like Who Do You Think You Are got really good ratings because people started tuning in. We were interested to see where a famous celebrity had come from. We loved it when they go back a few generations and there was a dodgy person in their past or when Danny Dyer, we found out, was a descendant of King Edward III. You see, most genealogies are about looking back. And whilst you can do that with biblical ones, they were actually a lot more interested about looking forward. I've called this, pa this passage study today the first list of names. Now, to be totally accurate, we had some names in a list in the previous chapter. We'll come back to them later. But this is the first list today that does this, that looks forward. It's the first list of the promise. It's the first list of the line of the seed that will come from Genesis 3, from where the snake crusher will come from. And there are lists throughout the Old Testament that do just that, that look forward to Jesus' coming. You know where you don't find too many lists? Well, in the New Testament. Why? Because it's about Jesus and he's come. These lists remind us that God had a plan, a plan throughout history, stretching forward, a plan to save, a plan through his son. The lists point to great news. So what then can we learn from this list we find here in Genesis chapter 5? Well, it turns out a lot, really. The first five verses are alone are an excellent summary of the teaching we've learned so far in Genesis. Chapter 5, 1 starts with God. Just like chapter 1, verse 1 did in the beginning, God. And here again we see the almighty, powerful creator, but also the loving father bringing forth life, human life into the world. In 5.2 we see this human life being both male and female made in the image of God. And we saw that and spent a lot of time thinking what that meant when Genesis 1.27. In 5 chapter 3 we see Adam and Eve having children as will all the other people in this list keep having children. And that's a fulfilment of Genesis 1.28. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. But it also shows us people's fallen state. That Seth in this list, and now every person after him, bears the image of Adam. Yes, still visible in some way is the image of God, but now that image is distorted and polluted by sin. Now all are in Adam. And chapter 5, verse 5 shows the result of that sin. Death. Yes, we've talked about spiritual death, separation from God, but actually here we see the result is physical death. Each person's description finishes with the line, and he died. But for the rest of our time this morning, I want to look at two names on this list. The two names on this list are interesting because they are people on this list from Seth's descendants, but they are also two people on the previous list that we saw in Cain's descendants. Now, the sceptic would say that these two people are the same people on both lists, and this would be evidence of the early Bible author getting himself in a mess. Some of those who would be kinder would say, well, no, it's correct. That these were two different people but it's just a coincidence. This is pretty early on in church history so it should, shouldn't surprise us that names would double up. 
in the same way you wouldn't be surprised to find the name Di Jones on many a Welsh family tree. But others, including myself, believe that these things don't happen as an accident and God is using them to teach his people. So let's have a look at the people with these two names. The first name is Enoch. And now we don't know an awful lot about Enoch in chapter 4, just that he was the son of Cain. The passage tells us that, uh, that Cain built a, a city and named it after his son. This city was for Enoch. Enoch settled in the city. He grew his family. He had children and grandchildren. And like we observed last week, they looked good. They were inventive. They were talented. Now, it doesn't seem that there was anything necessarily wrong with these things, but the fact jumps out that there's no mention of God anywhere in these verses. The narrative seems to suggest that this is people, human life, setting up camp away from God. The city itself could show that. A few verses earlier, we read last week, didn't we? Cain had been sent out. God had punished him. He told him he was going to be a wanderer on the earth. And what does Cain go and do? Well, he makes roots. He establishes himself. He builds a city for him and his family. You see, if Cain, Enoch and the rest of their family wanted a soundtrack for their lives, it would probably be Frank Sinatra's I did it my way. Now this is in contrast to Enoch in chapter 5 and we read these words of this Enoch. Enoch walked with God and he was not. Now there's an obvious question to ask here but the obvious question is not the important one. Our first question would be well what happened to him? But the most important question here is what does it mean to walk with God? Well, we did think about that a little when we were in Genesis 3. We thought how Adam and Eve walked in the garden with God. Now, we didn't say if it was physical or not there. It certainly wouldn't have been for Enoch. But what we did say there was that Adam and Eve were in communion with God. They had fellowship with God, even friendship with God. And this was true of Enoch. Hebrews 11 again expands this a bit more for us. In verse 5 it says this, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. Now we're told that Enoch pleased God. How did he do this? With his faith and his desire to seek God. He walked with God and he diligently sought after him. Well, what does that mean to seek God? Well, it's more than just knowing of God. It's more than just singing about him or debating about him. It's earnestly knowing and desiring God's presence, desiring his will in our lives, his law, his reign in us. And Enoch walked with God. He knew God. He sought after him in all these ways. And at the right time, God just took him. That only happens once more to a human in the Bible, Elijah. Just Elijah and Enoch. What does that mean Enoch was special? Does it mean because no one ever reached, no one ever else was taken in this way, that no one ever else reached that position with God? Well, Enoch is certainly commended for his faith. But I don't think his faith is unattainable. Or no one else in the history of the world since Enoch has sought God in this way. Now I believe God acted in this way to show us and to show everyone who followed Enoch what a life pleasing to God looked like. In the midst of sin and people walking away from God and rejecting him, here is one who walked 
with God. One who sought God above all things. So which Enoch are we like? Which Enoch am I? Which Enoch are you like? Chapter 4, who did it his way? Or chapter 5, Enoch, who walked with God? The easy answer is, well, I'm a Christian, so I'm obviously chapter 5, Enoch. But I've been challenged by Enoch this week. I also read these words midweek in Psalm 63. Verse 1 says this, So God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And as I thought about Enoch this week, and as I read these words of David, I've been challenged. Do I know this earnest seeking of God? Do I know this desperate thirst for God that David speaks of here? Do I desire God's presence? Do I desire his way, his reign above everything else in my life? What if I, or what if you were to take God out of your life? What if you were to remove God out of your life? What would change? How would your life look different without God in it? Would our daily routine change? Would our priorities change? Would our actions change? Would our decision making change if you took God out? Because it should, shouldn't it? And it would have for Enoch and David. If you had taken God out of their lives, well, they would have been unrecognisable. And I pray for myself and I pray for you too, that we would be like Enoch chapter 5. That we would walk with God. That we would earnestly seek him. That we would live lives pleasing to him. To finish then, let's look at uh, the second name shared by two people in the different lists. And that is Lamech. Lamech chapter 4 we thought a little about last week. Lamech continues the family tune. He did it his way. He is a picture of pride, reveling in what he has built in his family, in his wealth, in his status. We said last week he celebrated his sin, the disproportional killing of a young man because he had hurt him. He wants everyone to know who he is, what he has done, and that he is very happy in the situation he finds himself in now. Lamech chapter 4 is here. He is for the here and now. And he is here for himself. Well, Lamech chapter 5 couldn't be more different. Again, we know very little of him. But just the snippet we are given here in the naming of his son tells us a lot. Unlike his namesake, he is aware of what is around him. Aware that what he experiences is not right. He is aware of sin. He is aware of his sinfulness and his inability to change that. But he is looking forward. He is looking forward. He is looking to God's provision. He's looking for God's comfort and looking for God's rest. You see, and that's the difference here. Enoch and Lamech chapter 4, well, they built a city. But Enoch and Lamech in chapter 5 were looking to a kingdom. A kingdom that lasts forever. If the song of chapter 4 is, I did it my way, then Enoch and Lamech in chapter 5 sing the song of David in Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. 
beholding your power and glory because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. Well, what about us this morning? What about me? What about you? Are we building here? Are we for the here and now in ourselves? Are we doing it our way? Or are we looking to God? Are we looking to him? Are we looking to his future? I pray that we are joining in that song. Your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. Amen.